This is the Move the World podcast. Interviews with people dedicated to making the world a better place. With your host, George Siegel. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Move the World podcast, where every week we introduce you to somebody who's doing something in their life or in their work, their job, to try and move the world. And my guest today is a gentleman who's got a, a big task at hand that he's trying to do, and I'm sure you all will understand it when we meet him. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to Jordan Scott, a full-time baseball foul ball safety advocate, bringing compelling arguments to listening audiences for proper safety netting. Jordan, welcome. Thanks, George. Thanks so much for having me. All right, Jordan. In a, in a nutshell, tell us what you're doing to try and move the world. Understandably, um, understandably so, uh, I think the, the moving that I'm pushing towards is bringing common sense to an industry that sorely needs it. Um, baseball, you know, another way of putting it can be described as the baseball maiming society. And when people start seeing through how often these incidences come about, I think they'll conclude that most insiders, people that understand the game intimately, the players, the owners, the broadcasters, the baseball writers, know it's a matter of if, it's not a matter of if something will get crushed, it's when. And that's the epiphany that needs to be brought to light. And I think people will be receptive once we get into this interview. And I'm looking forward to getting into that with you. So thank you for asking a strong question. Absolutely. And you know what? I think people w would absolutely get it. You know, when I was, um, I thought I was the only one that felt this way until I saw your bio and what you were doing. When I was a 16 year old kid, I was with some friends at Dodger Stadium and we were just gotten all our food. So we had like five or six 16 year old kids just stuffing their faces in the stands and a screaming ball came in a, a little bit away from us, but it was close, so close enough that it really got our attention. And what we were joking about was what Vin Scully would have been saying of those kids stuffing their faces who just got drilled by a ball and how we would have been on television is kind of a laughing stock. But now you take that forward to where people have actually been seriously injured and even killed at a baseball game. And that's, that's kind of insane to think that it could be that dangerous. Yeah. And it's, it's funny that you bring up Dodger stadium, the two deaths that have occurred at major league games amongst the fans were both at Dodger stadium. One in 1970, probably similar, unfortunately to the group that you were with, bunch of 14 year olds hanging out and Alan Fish got struck in the head and died a few days later. And, you know, ultimately the guys like Vince Scully and the producers who work for these shows have not had honest discussions with the fan base. You're not at home watching Vince Scully, hearing him say something like, there's great risk. It's only a matter of the next game or the game after before something gets crushed. Hopefully not a person. It could be a beer. It could be a seat. Or it could be a ricochet of, off, a, off a beer or a seat and, and hit somebody. But Alan Fish had died in 1970. I don't think people really understand, too, what buying that ticket, what rights they're giving up when they walk into the stadium. I mean, you you can be in a commercial for baseball. They can throw you out for doing something inappropriate if you're put up on the Jumbotron. Um, you're basically there. You're giving up your rights when you go in and get that seat. And that obviously extends to their liability if you get drilled by a, a screaming line drive, doesn't it? Unfortunately, it does. And, and baseball has had their legal due diligence taken care of for for over a hundred years uh for most of those years the, the the micro print was on the back of the ticket where most families did not study it 
or consult with their attorney before attending a baseball game. Uh, and now people even have to search harder on the e-ticket to find out that their baseball will not be responsible. Um, but I do know, I do know this, that baseball does whatever they can to keep it as broadcast as minimally broadcasted as possible. So just think about it. Imagine if that microprint had gone up on the scoreboard or if somebody hacked Dodger Stadium scoreboard and put that legal jazz on the back, the back of the ticket legal jazz up on the scoreboard, all of a sudden families would be looking at it in larger print and connecting the dots and wondering, why am I sitting here with our growing family? And are we in any jeopardy? It would sort of heighten the assumed risk. So in essence, certainly one could say that no children should have ever, ever been allowed in any of those sections since 1970 when Alan Fisher died at Dodger Stadium. And if adults, wanted to sit there and flirt with 100 mile per hour balls, well, then maybe that's okay, but they know exactly what they're doing. Once they get to the ballpark, they are signing a piece of paper and their kids are nowhere near them and they do want to flirt with danger. Well, that's another arrangement. Well, you know, I got to believe, I, I still don't think people would not go. I, I don't think that, I think there's a lot of stupid things people do. You see a hurricane coming and people go in and swim at the beach. Uh, there's a thunderstorm. People go outside. And what I don't think people understand, if you went out with your kid just to play catch in the yard and they throw the ball at you every now and then it misses a glove and hits somebody in the face or in the body. And, and, and we're not athletes. And that doesn't really that, that hurts. So if you're just even catching a high pop up at a baseball game or a home run ball or anything with your bare hands, there's a reason those guys are wearing gloves. I, even those things have their share of injuries with people breaking fingers and hurting themselves. So there's all kinds of vulnerability when you go to such a, such an event. I do know the frequency, how often somebody is seriously injured from statistics where we're not talking fingers and nails, we're talking heads and eyes. And in 2019, in the last regular season, when there was a full a full slate of games in the major leagues, and this is only from the major leagues, there was 15 people maimed in a 26 and a half week season, and all of those probably required some kind of emergency room visits. And they're documented by uh, Kelsey McKenney from Deadspin. That's just one, uh, one example. The Los Angeles Times reported uh, 4,500 people from 2012 to 2019, um, based on an NBC report, we took the math. I, I said 5,000 fans reported to first aid between 2012 and 2019. The LA Times guy suggested 4,500, but we're pretty close. That reported to first aid at major league games. Now, were most of those fingers and nails I would say probably, but is it possible that in the hundreds there were concussions and lost eyes and crushed skulls? I think so. It's not, it's not a stretch to say that uh, because people do get hit in the head. Um, and certainly the people that have been coming to foul ball safety now, and I'm not that social media savvy, I have a handful of people that have been coming, sharing their injuries, including Erwin Goldblum, whose wife also, she was the second person who died at Dodger Stadium in the last 50 years. She got killed at the end of August in 2018, Linda Goldblum. And Irwin's attended about six or seven of my virtual Zoom calls this past year. I had hired a publicist up until June of 2021. From November 2020 till June of 2021, I did hire a publicist and we've held these zoom calls and some of the other people that showed up to these zoom calls and entertain questions from the media were um, two alexis's one was uh, four when she was hurt four years old and one was 10 both hit in the head and both inches from death um 
little Alexis, who was four, who's now around 14, she's got some long-term post-neurological things. And, uh, and the other Alexis from, 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 uh, who also got her at a minor league game, um, she's, uh, she's recovering better. But she speaks about her, 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 her question, her, her scenario about what happened to her. And she wrote about it in her college paper. And what they're saying, these impact statements, which are coming out, George, are people don't want it to happen to the next pe person. They don't realize people going to the games. They look at foul balls and fun. They don't look at foul balls and flirting with death. Yeah. And you see that all the time. You're right. And, and, and you see it all the time with, with people with a kid in their arm trying to catch the ball or they're sitting there on their phones. I think now they're compared to in the 70s, 80s, 90s, even the early uh, 21st century, we didn't have a device in our hands that we were playing with instead of watching the game. So the attention now on, on what could be coming your way is far worse. Well, even staring without blinking for three hours, you can't protect your kid. When management or owners are saying things like, oh, watch your kids, or we have signs posted, you can't get out of the way of a hooking 100 mile an hour, hooking 100 mile an hour ball. No more Garcia Para, who played with the Dodgers for a short time, maybe when he was with the Red Sox, maybe throughout his career, would go to the railing when he was playing third base and tell the dad and the kid to switch seats. So the dad would be an inch closer to home plate than he would than the he or she would be the child. You know, it's like that's a little obsessive, but he also knew those were the dangers. Oh, you see how upset the players are. You see, you can see how devastated they are when they rock one into the stands, rocket one in there, and it hits somebody. I think they they probably feel horrible about that. Well, sure they do. And and but they haven't done much to change. The, the establishment. They tell their own families. If you go to foulballsafetynow.com, you'll see I stack the quotes when it's usually in the aftermath when somebody gets hurt. Um, I got involved all the way in 2019 after that little girl got hurt in Houston by Al Mora. And you've seen or you've heard players say things usually in the aftermath. Of, of one of these injuries. I've had minor league players. There's about 5,000 minor league players that are trying to be major leaguers. Uh, there's six or 700 major league jobs. Most of them will not make it through their journey. But it'll stop and they'll have to get a, another kind of job, but they're trying. Um, so these minor leaguers bear the burden knowing they could be the next one to do the, the maiming in the minor leagues. They tell their moms and dads, but they're, they're not going to get on the public address and say, hey, you guys need to sit with my mom and dad behind the nets. You're all crazy. And I have strong quotes from minor league players who will be in my forthcoming book when it, when it eventually does come out. Speaking of this double standard, and I have baseball players who tell their own families, sit behind the nets. What about everybody else? So there's a double standard. And I hold everyone accountable. And I think at this stage of the game, th there should not be no such thing as a baseball hall of fame. And when I first started writing two years ago, I self-published some articles. I said things that didn't take me more than a few weeks to come up with things like baseball writers definitely do not deserve to be in any kind of hall of fame. You don't preserve, you don't put yourself in a place of higher honor when you've been sort of complicit You've been your journalists. I hold you guys to a higher standard in New York, where I'm from. There's probably 25 sports writers who all attended journalism school. Um, and they have not to this point been able to convey or haven't had the courage to say enough is enough. We need to stop this double standard. So obviously, if baseball players are telling all their own families to sit behind the nets, why not survey the baseball writers and ask them where their families are sitting and how come they're not conveying it to their readers? Yeah, it does. When you look at ballparks now, like we have Tropicana Field here in Tampa, there's now a net that goes down the sidelines. Ah, Tropicana Field. I have something to say about that. Uh -huh. Okay, but there, I want to hear that. But there are nets netting now that goes down the first base and third base side. So people 
on the lower level aren't going to get clocked. But if you're in the 200 or 300 level, you could still get drilled by a ball pretty easily. Sure. So with Tampa Bay, I have a video up there before there were nets above the dugout. If anyone wants to take a look at foul ball safety now, it's right there up on the website. It shows before nets were up, a ball going in between two guys. And if that ball had hit one of those guys, that would have been the end of baseball in Tampa Bay that year. The nets would have been up. There would have been an outcry. Um, so if anyone wants to check it out, please do. The only way that we'll know that Tampa Bay or any of the other 30 professional stadiums are good to go and are maiming free is if an independent netting council, some sort of regulatory agency says we're sending in our architects and engineers. It's not up to MLB to tell us how high, how far, how wide the nets are going to be. It's up to this independent netting council's architects and engineers they could figure out how fast the balls and go how often oh you mean it's every day balls travel at 100 miles an hour or is it every 50 years oh it's more like every day oh okay well then why were the nets only up to there and not up to there you can't walk past a building when bricks are coming down from time to time they would say you need to have the cement in place to hold the bricks I'm just giving an example. Yeah. Of, uh, you, you know, this is 53,000 balls, foul balls every year in the major leagues. Now, some guy who wrote a bit more about it says, well, only 20,000 or so reach the seats. All right. So it's still 20,000 reach the seats. How many are going at X amount speeds? Plenty. And nobody talks about the minor leagues, which is a mess in 2021. George, I called 100 minor league ballparks. There's 30 major league clubs. There's 120 minor league clubs remaining. I connected to close to 100 of them. All I did was ask them simple questions. Where do your nets go? At least 42 had told me no nets past the end of dugouts. Where did that little girl in Houston get crushed? Past the end of the dugout. Mrs. Goldblum at Dodger Stadium. She died behind home plate. Nobody talks about home plate behind home plate at Dodger Stadium or the other 29 other ballparks where there's higher levels. She died 93 mile an hour ball. Dodgers took a year. Did they take care of it the day after? Did games continue for a full year? Pretty much so, yes. So it's like there's no way at Georgia if we're walking down the street and a brick comes close to even hitting us nobody's walking down that street till the thing is taken care of. It's ridiculous, but that's the way it goes with baseball. Exactly. And at minor league ballparks, you're closer to the action than you are in a major league ballpark. So the ball would in theory be traveling faster. Hey, like I said, architects and engineers know how fast the balls are reaching people. They, everything is now statistics. We know the ball with the exit velocity, George uh, Stanton, the guy on the Yankees, if anyone wants to Google a foul ball, a, a home run he hit, um, it, it shot out to right field and it hit the kid in the head. Now, I'm wondering if it went an inch or this way or that way. Maybe it would have taken out his eye. And this was a few weeks ago. Um, uh, uh, call, uh, Gian, Gian Carlo, John Car Gian yeah, Carlo. Gian Carlo yeah. Stanton. You can Google home run, Angel Hernandez, CBS, something like that. You'll see the video. You'll see it in slow motion. And, you know, I, I'm looking more into that incident. I'm going to ask somebody if it just went this way or that way would have taken out his eye at like a half an inch. I mean, it hit him directly in the head, in the noggin. Uh, and supposedly he was all right. He shook it off. I was like, wow. I don't know. And how, so if it left his bat at 106, how long does it take? You know, did, did it hit his head at 92 or 84 miles per hour? I mean, I mean, this is what's happening. Now, if, if there's an independent netting council and they say this can continue to be, this cannot be, I go by what they say. I, I don't care if people catch pop ups, balls come up and down, but it's above my pay grade. I just want to have a real discussion, a first time discussion. But clearly, in the minor leagues today, what a mess. 
four, at least 42, no nets past end of dugouts. In Peoria, Illinois, if people go to foul ball safety now, I actually rented out an airplane and it towed a banner over Peoria three, four months ago when they opened up their season because they didn't even have netting over the dugout. And we were just talking about that the video that I have up on my website, which compares to Peoria. I had Tara, who produces commercials for me, take the Peoria scenario of today and show the Tampa Bay picture of yesterday, seven years ago, whatever it was. What can happen to fans when there's no nets above the dugout? And Peoria had the nerve to open up this season. They had no baseball last year because we were all shut down or at least the minor leagues were shut down last year. And they gave some, some excuses that the net was uh, on order from Europe. How would any buildings department allow a building to operate when the cement was on order from Europe? Hello, get the cement up there. Don't allow the people to walk underneath. What is this? So that's what's going on Peoria. And they're an affiliate of the St. Louis Cardinals, Peoria, Illinois. And the St. Louis Cardinals probably worth billions of dollars they're paying the salaries of the peoria chiefs to whack the ball where people are in harm's way and most families even in 2021 they haven't reached that epiphany of outrage they haven't reached once they do find out that they've been sort of part of a part of a weekly or bi-weekly possibility of a terrible statistic they can and say, wow, we were really having good times under false pretenses. If there's any way I knew my four and six year old were possibly going to be taken to the emergency room or be part of a statistic, I don't think they'd be part of it. So we haven't we haven't yet gotten the message to the general public. And that is that is a problem. Now, do you remember a, a film that came out years ago it was with James Kahn? It was called Rollerball. And it was a futuristic game where they played on this rink and balls would go firing into the stands and kill people. And that was just part of the game. And they still had a packed crowd and somebody would die and they would just drag them out of there. And, and to me, that really sizes up the mentality. I think the people that have, are injured would relate to you. But a lot of people are going to be like, oh, it's a baseball game. Why are you worried about this? And I don't know that they understand the danger unless they really see it. And, and, and realize what's going on, I think they would call us killjoys for being concerned about this. Yeah. Un unfortunately, there is a lot of negativity. Now, ESPN did a piece. It's up on the website two years ago. I thought it was a great piece. It's actually parallel or in line with what I'm trying to convey over here at Foul Ball Safety Now, where it's a five minute video. It's a high quality production. It, it, it shows balls hitting people with good video, not YouTube video. It's just very, very good stuff. So what happened? Uh, they got their 750,000 views. They got their 4,300 comments. 80% of those comments were negative. They were like, mind your own business. Uh, uh, pay, to pay attention to the game, put down your phone. So that seems to be the case when there's a large number on 4,300. 4, ESPN also did another kind of survey, but maybe I, I'm not sure actually how they did it. And I put that up on my website because it said 78% of the fans do agree that netting is a good idea. Um, but ESPN also has a major contract with MLB and oh so so what i've been doing since that video i thought it was great production it, you know for, for 18 months it's been sitting uh nobody's been commenting in it nobody's been promoting it espn hasn't continually promoted it like why aren't they continually promoting it so for the last two months i spent more than a thousand bucks promoting it because i feel it's important to keep this conversation going and I'm like, wow, this is a great production. Tara can't do that for 500 bucks, you know, but ESPN could do this and they've cost them 100,000 to do this. I'm going to use it. If they're not going to promote it, I'm going to promote it because it's, uh, it's a great piece. So, you know, I'm going to continue to promote that piece. I just want to bring an epiphany of outrage to the fan base. I think once the fans realize this, 
They're not asking for netting. If you look at my website, the major league report, the minor league report in 2021, when I called the box offices, the major leagues, 30 teams, they're, when you look at the seating charts, it doesn't speak of netting and transparency. Only like three out of the 30 teams have websites on their seating charts that really show anything to do with nets. Now, that means the general public is not demanding it. If the general public was demanding it, all 30 of the MLB teams would have, wow, oh, yeah, here's where we should be sitting where our kids and this is what's recommended and this is what the Independent Netting Council said you should be doing or, you know, it, it doesn't speak of, you know, netting transparency or, or awareness. Uh, when I called the minor league cities, I spoke to nearly 100 minor league ballparks. And when I, and when I spoke to the young person who was working in the box office or whoever I talked to, they would say, oh, you're the first person asking about where the nets are. I'm like, exactly, wow. exactly. Oh, I don't get that call. Let me find out. You know, and they used to look on their seating chart. And they would have to find out. But it was like the general public in 2021 is still not demanding it. If they were, there would be nets. Well, the reality is it doesn't change your view that much because you get used to it really quickly. And the most expensive seats in the house, the ones behind home plate have been behind netting for years. And those people pay a premium to sit there in a, in a safe environment. Yes, there's no, there's no doubt about it. But it, it's sort of like regulatory agencies came in in the 1970s and they said, sorry, parents, you don't have any more discretion. Your kids have to be seat belted in the back. That's the law. And they should have been here in 1970 and said something to the same effect that, hey, you can't bring your kids. You guys want to work something out with the Dodgers or any other teams and flirt with danger? Okay, that's your call. You know, in Japan, they allow you to sit in certain sections. They give you a helmet and a glove. I doubt you're allowed to bring your kid, but they call them the excitement seats. Our culture is so secretive about it. And I, I do say that baseball is a secretive culture run by lawyers. And I believe when Manford took the keys from Selig, he said to Selig said to Manfred, you make sure those secrets stay secret. And those secrets are all those injuries that are at MLB headquarters that if they ever saw the light of day and they have it, there's only been a few independent studies like NBC and the ESPN report from time to time. There's some decent journalism. Um, but that's basically the, uh, the, the word that, that Selig said to Manfred. You make sure those secrets stay secret. In courts, when people have tried to sue, usually they don't make it out of the lawyer's office because the lawyer says, sorry, you're not going to get anywhere. That micro print on the back of the e-ticket or the ticket, they, they covered their ass and you guys don't have, a, you don't have a shot. And then in some cases, they've gotten early into the proceedings and the judge will say, same thing. And then once in a while, some somewhere in the middle of the proceedings, the judge will say something like, okay, let's see what baseball really knew. So it's called discovery. And that's when baseball gets nervous because they don't want baseball to be revealed. They don't want the secrets to be revealed. So they'll make a settlement with that particular plaintiff. And then, then there was a case recently in the last two months, which has been some momentum, uh, this thing called willful and wanton. Willful want on spelled that way, where it implied the judge is allowing a case to proceed in Illinois for, um, I think his name is Eddie Rybarski, who was smashed in the face uh, three years ago in Chicago. Uh, and the Rybarski case is, can continue, is continuing. Um, and the judge said something which is a strong implication. The willful wanton implies that baseball consciously knew in advance that Nets could have gone further or higher. And they made a decision just to do it minimal. And like, that don't work. And let's hope that case, hopefully willful and wanton becomes a household name. And 70 million fans will be, you know, wearing T-shirts that say willful and wanton baseball because they're no different from big tobacco. 
I have it up on my website. Baseball knows the risks. Let's not kid anyone. They know the risks and they know a handful of souls every year are going to feel displaced, bitter. They're going to want an apology. They'll never get an apology. They'll want their medical bills paid for. And it has a long-term effect. They don't want their children playing baseball. They, they won't. These people need to be welcomed back into the game. How many hundreds of, or thousands of people who had a head injury and had long-term injuries over the last, you know, 50 years, um, don't watch the game, don't even turn it on anymore, don't even want their kids playing baseball. A lady who interviewed with me for the book, Jenny, in 1979 at Shea Stadium, she was 14 years old, she lost her eye. And when she became a mom years later, she told me that she was relieved that her son chose not to play baseball. So it has this long-term effect. And yeah, these people need to be welcomed back into the game and, and their impact statements need to be heard. And I have a handful of people that are sharing and hopefully more that keep finding me. So let me ask you this. How do you support this quest of yours? How do you, how do you keep this going? Yeah. So, you know, I, I welcome anyone who, ha who has expendable dollars to make a statement with me and there's an airplane to rent and a banner to tow and things to do. But yes, it's mostly been self-funded. Um, and, you know, I hope that, uh, you know, we'll get the attention of people uh, and create an epiphany of outrage with somebody who's more influential than me that tells me, hey, Jordan, this is really great. I thank you so much for bringing this to me. You can go back to selling real estate. We got it from here. We're going to put some significant dollars into it and we're going to make some real statements. Um, so that would be amazing. I'd be like, yes, I'll be your cheerleader. I'm glad I introduced it to you. Now you take it from here. Or uh, the book will be coming out when the time is right, when I have an audience to contribute uh, to, to distribute to. Um, um, I'm looking into, you know, getting advocacy in Japan because in Japan, this is already readily accepted in their culture. Uh, so why not get a country behind me if that, what, that's what it takes uh, for them to sign a petition? Because there are two petitions on my website. One is to repeal the baseball rule. One is for expanded netting, uh, extended or expanded netting. Um, so, you know, I made this get uh, 10,000 signatures from Japan with some social media and influencer over there so i'm looking into that right now because that may help maybe they'll you know be interested intrigued in reading my story uh you know whether it comes out in an ebook form whether it comes out in hard copy but in the meanwhile i'm still collecting stories people are finding me a foul ball safety now they could talk to me in confidence they could talk to me on the record with my co-writer brendan we interview people we're, we're really really getting some really compelling stories from folks. Um, so, you know, things are, uh, things are really happening and, um, I'm, I'm excited about the journey. So it, it stays, I'm, I'm cool about it. It's great having programs like yours, George, that come aboard. Sometimes you may meet somebody like yourself that takes the next step with me, uh, creating documentaries or, or doing whatever we need to do just to keep this issue going. So I'm open to hearing anyone from anyone with any question, concern, or, or, or if they know anyone who's been injured by foul balls, they can talk to me in confidence, or anyone who out there, out there has an expendable dollar or two and feels like we can make a statement, we can have a conversation. So it's a great opportunity, George. And, you know, there's so many, so many things that just people need to know about. So do you think you moved the needle at all? Do you, do, you, do you think the reason more netting has gone into major league parks has anything to do with what you're doing? Or are they starting to realize the danger? Because they are adding more, just not enough. No, but it's, it's piecemeal. And as I was suggesting, the willful wanton scenario, which is baseball needs to bring in the outside regulatory agencies and the story get it done. There's 42 ballparks that are hosting games with no netting past dugouts. Where did that little girl get crushed past the end of the dugout? You need to get this done. It's not, you know, it's foreseeable. It's predictable. There's thousands of balls that reach the seats. There's three times as many more games in the minor leagues. Um, when I suggested 4,500 uh, injuries from 2012 to 2019, that was just to me, that was just the uh, major leagues. 
you know, so we're talking about 13,500 in the minor leagues in t- between 2012 and 2019, there was approximately 2,400 major league games a year and approximately 9,000 minor league games a year. So, you know, this is, I have documented children incidences, mostly recorded from the major leagues. I have 43 between 2008 and 2019, serious injuries to little children. And this is stuff I just found through newspaper clippings. Uh, Serious injuries from 2008 to 2019, 43. Most of those were accounted from the major leagues, but it also suggests maybe there were three times as many more of those children hurt in the minor leagues because there's less media coverage there or there's less documented, uh, you know, consistency. How do you think Major League Baseball feels about you? I, I don't think they really, they just hope I go away, but I'm not. I don't think I've really made any... You know, I've gotten some great articles. Yes, uh, People Magazine, LA Times. Uh, when I say great, I, nothing's great about them. It. It's great that this publicity team that I had got me some earned media, but they were non-baseball journalists that reported on it. And it was just a summary of the issue. Nobody's written really any sort of long piece. Uh, baseball journalists, why is non-baseball journalists writing about this? baseball journalists like i said in new york there's 25 of those folks that work full-time and they're journalists and they should be asked the same question as baseball players do you tell your own families and i'd love to hear their reactions they're not going to talk to me i've gotten a few sarcastic responses from some baseball journalists and they said oh it's the owners they should have to take care of it no man you're at every game you see every pitch of every game you should be you should have been taken a position on this a long time ago or they should be on an elevator or an airplane with me and we should i should ask them what some of the baseball players say and look at some of the quotes of foul ball safety now you could go to the major and minor league reports i stacked up all the quotes i could find of players that said about their own families of that they will not sit near um uh, Without netting, they will not do where there's no nets. And it's funny, this coach who died, I bring him up, Mike Kuba, um, he died in 2008 as a player in the 1980s. He was the guy, oh, he was a coach in the minor leagues, and he got struck, got struck in the neck, but mm-hmm. they're all still, they're wearing helmets, but just the same. That. Yeah, he's, they're wearing helmets. Um, yeah. It's, so there was some proactive movement there by MLB, all the minor leagues and the major leagues the following season started wearing the helmets. Okay, so there's some proactive initiative there. But Mike Kuba, when he was a player in the 80s, his wife is quoted as saying, Mike would always tell me to sit behind the nets. We're talking in the 1980s. So how ironic, he's the guy who got struck. Uh, yeah. But he would tell, he, he told his wife, you get, you know, during the game, if she was talking to a friend, you go behind the nets. And they knew this back in the 80s. They all these players knew this. My elite players are telling me this sure. now. I mean, and but they're on the dream of being they're on the journey of being, you know, major leaguers. So, you know, they're not going to be whistleblowers. They, yeah, they tell their own mom and dad that they do. But they, it can't be a good feeling bearing the burden, knowing they could be the next one to do the maiming. Yep. I would love to hear a conversation between you and Bob Costas about this. But I'd love to them to sit on an airplane with me because I think it will be like students or flight attendant. Students isn't a great term these days. Flight attendant, please switch my seats. You know, that kind of thing. So yeah. you'd, you'd be absolutely. taken off the plane, no doubt. Yeah, so yeah, la- yeah. Or, or get this guy out of here. Exactly. Yeah. Last question. Sure. It, what will you consider success? Well, how will this, how will you come away from this feeling like you moved the world? Um, I think once, once there's some recognition or some whistleblower, you know, a baseball player or, or, or a journalist that puts their foot down and does something about it and, you know, George says that's enough. I mean, Jeff Passon from ESPN went on PBS John Yang shortly after the little girl got hurt in Houston and he said all the right things to regulatory agencies and nets. But what happened? It was very short lived. 
as far as I know, Jeff is still working for ESPN, collecting a paycheck, and most of his work is baseball related. So is it, it's, it's nice that people say strong things after these incidences, but the fact is I was the only one that I know of that contradicted Major League Baseball. Manfred said something in 2019 that everyone's doing significant changes for the next time we open up baseball again in 2020. All I know is I called 2020 spring training before we all shut down with the COVID. I spoke to box offices that hosted those 30 major league teams and found that that 16, one six still had no netting past the end of dugouts. And then I did more work again this year in the minor leagues and found out that more than 40% of the stadiums of ballparks that I spoke to still had no nets past the end of dugouts. This is things get crushed past the end yeah. of dugouts. And I don't understand why we're continuing on as a baseball community and society. So, um, yeah, you know, as, as far as I know, as far as I'm concerned, all owners should be forced to sell the team. It's time for a changing of the guard and certainly stop praising yourself, baseball players and baseball writers, and don't put yourself in any sort of hall of fame until this matter is addressed until those people that I know of, and probably hundreds more are fully addressed, apologize to, and their apology would be accepted because then these people, these victims would only accept their apology if baseball was serious with their apology. That means nobody else is going to have the same scenario as those folks with the head injuries and that kind of thing. So, well, I'm not going to hold my breath, but I certainly am, uh, am rooting for you in the sense you. of it needs to be safer. There's no question about it. Thank um, you, George. This is a really great platform and I really appreciate everyone listening and anyone has any thoughts, just go to foulballsafetynow.com. All right, Jordan Scott, continued success. Uh, hope you move the world. Let's let's hope right. you have some success. Thank you that's, again, George. Thanks again. All right, that's going to do it for this episode of Move the World. As Jordan was talking about, you can see what he's been doing for years. It's an uphill battle to try and make a difference, but he continues to do it. And that's what we all need to do is find something in our lives so we can try to move the world. We'll see you next time. <laughs>